good to go. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Rule of Two. Today, we have a very special guest once again, Gary Witta, the screenwriter of Rogue One, and also he's worked on so much more. I saw that when I searched you up that you worked on um, The Walking Dead, too, which we didn't talk about. Uh, what did yeah. you do on there? I So um, just to be clear, that was the video game version of The War. Telltale Games did this okay. amazing um, interactive video game adaptation of The Walking Dead that came out in 2012. I think it ran for four seasons in the end. I, played I, it. Was, a, I was a writer and story consultant on season one. Okay. Um, so I was story consultant across the whole season. I wrote episode four. And then I also wrote a piece of 400 Days, which was a kind of an anthology uh, spinoff that they did subsequently after season one. Right. And for everybody wanting to uh, join Gary's Twitch, Twitter, or YouTube, I've linked them all in the description down below. So be sure to check those out. Thank um, you. I would love to hear how you got the, the job to work on Rogue One. Uh, you essentially, you were telling us just before we started that you wrote the whole thing from scratch. So... And then, of course, you got revisions and all that. So take us through everything. Well, so let me, so let me first just clarify that to make sure, sure. That I'm not, you know, claiming more credit than than I'm due. I so John Knoll, who, as you of course certainly know, is kind of legendary. You know, one of the one of the pioneers of industrial light and magic, and uh, is still there in a very senior capacity and still does all kinds of amazing work. John was actually the guy that came up with the idea mm -hmm. of doing the first Star Wars, you know, story that could be separate from. The Skywalker saga and his idea was why don't we tell the story of the rebels that stole the Death Star plans he basically wanted to tell the story of the opening crawl you know rebel spies who during the battle yeah. rebel spies stole the secret plans and that was his big idea and he took it to Kathleen Kennedy and pitched her on the whole concept and she she dug it he had like a whole presentation um but Joe you know, John's not a writer he's a visual effects guy and so they're like, well we need someone to you know develop this storyline he didn't just have an idea he actually did have like I think it was like a two-page document that laid out very, very early versions of, you know, Jin Erso and K2 and like some of the, some of the characters were there, uh, but they didn't have like it fleshed out. Like, you know, they weren't ready to make a movie yet. And so uh, where I came in was, man, it's funny. I still remember um, where I was when uh, I heard that Disney had bought Lucasfilm and that Star Wars was coming back, you know, after having kind of laid fallow for so many years I was, I was standing in line uh, at a Popeye's fried chicken waiting for my order. And I was just scrolling through Twitter on my phone, just bored, you know, as you do. And my Twitter blew up and it was like, you know, because of the news that had happened. And, you know, yeah. it wasn't even, they haven't even, haven't even announced JJ at that point. If you remember, it was Michael Arndt had been announced that was going to yeah, write right. what at that time was just known as episode seven. They were going to do seven, eight, nine, but there was no talk yet about standalone films or anything. That all came later. But I, I remember immediately swiping away from my Twitter app and going to my phone and calling my agent and saying, I know that you're, all your clients are calling you today, but like, you got to get me in the room for Star Wars because that's, you know, why we're all, that's why I do what I do. And obviously this would be a dream. And I was fully aware of the fact that there was like hundreds of writers above me in the pecking order. One of the, one of the luxuries of working on a, or running a franchise like Star Wars, if you're Kathy Kennedy or Dave Filoni or whatever, like who doesn't want to come play with you? You know, it's Star right, Wars. Right. And yeah. so you can attract all this top tier talent. And I thought, and you look at Michael Arndt, one of the biggest screenwriters in Hollywood was the first person there. I'm not on Michael Arndt's level, not even close. And so I thought, listen, I'm not going to, there's no way they're even going to take a meeting with me, but you got to shoot your shot, right? The 10 year old kid in me is going to never going to let me go to sleep at night if I don't at least try. And so my agent said, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll try, but you know what the odds are. Said, yeah, of course, but you, you've got to try. And then some time went by and I could basically kind of forgot all about it. And then my agent uh, called me uh, back and said, do you want to take a meeting with Lucasfilm? They're interested in meeting you on a, on a general thing. So I, absolutely. And I live up here in San Francisco. Most of Hollywood obviously is down in LA, oh, cool. but, uh, but Lucasfilm's kind of split. They have offices down at the Disney compound in Burbank, but they also have Lucasfilm up in the Presidio here in San Francisco, which is just around the corner from me. So let, let's set it up. Um, and I was super excited to go. They have a beautiful campus there at, at the Presidio. And I sat down and I was very nervous. I had no idea. There was no prep. It wasn't like, you know, get ready to pitch or anything. It was just like they want to meet you. And going, you know, meeting, going for a meeting at Lucasfilm is kind of like going for a meeting like the CIA. You know, they're so mm -hmm. secretive and they tell you nothing. And so I went in knowing nothing. And I sat down with um, these two amazing people who I came to love, Kiri Hart, who used to run the story group at Lucasfilm, and Rain Roberts, who was another senior story executive there. Kiri since moved on, but Rain is still there in quite a senior position. Now. I think she runs like the whole film group. And they sat me down and I was like, why am I here? Like, you know, you know, I love Star Wars, but like, do you want me to pitch you ideas? Like what's going on? And they were just like, no, you know, we just want to talk to you. We're obviously talking to a lot of writers. We've got a lot of projects cooking right now and we want to 
basically just get a feel of who's out there and what kind of projects we might want to plug them into. They weren't interested in hearing outside pitches. They already kind of had a plan for what they wanted to make. It was mm -hmm. a question of like, can we find the right writers to pair up with the right projects? Right. And so I just talked to them about my love of Star Wars. I, just I talked to them about how when I was a kid and I was 11 years old, I cried at the end of Return of the Jedi because I was so overcome with emotion and how I would take my Han Solo action figure and put him in the ice cube tray and stick him in the freezer and freeze him in carbonite and then thaw him out under the warm, under the warm tap. Uh, and just how much, yeah, I just told all my little anecdotes and stories about just how much I love Star Wars. Yeah. And I kind of got the impression that, that maybe they were talking to me because I knew obviously that there's, there was going to be a big multimedia effort. There wasn't just going to be films. There would be television. There would be comic books. There would be video games, which is the world I come from. There would be all of these things, novels. And I thought they, I, I'd be happy to have done any of those things. I wasn't snobby about it. I thought anything that was Star Wars, just to contribute just a small piece to that canon would you know be a dream come true and they said okay well nice to meet you and i left knowing nothing more than i went in with and i waited around for a while I thought, oh you know they've forgotten about me they've, they've found someone else that they liked for whatever project they may have been thinking of me for but they did call back and said hey we're going to send you a document to look at and they sent me this pdf and uh, i opened it up and it was this thing called destroyer of worlds and this is th that's what it was called at the time that was john that was john Knoll's kind of code name for it and it was like this two-page document that basically laid out this idea of a team of rebels that steal the plans of the Death Star and set up, you know, what, you know, what, what would go on to be a new hope. And I genuinely called them and said, I think you've sent me the wrong document here because this appears to be a treatment or an idea for a feature film. Mm -hmm. Like, surely that's not, and they, no, oh, yeah, no, what do you think? It's like, oh my God, absolutely. Like, I'm in, seriously. Yeah. And I kind of got, I kind of felt like very out of my depth. I was like, oh my God, are you talking to me? You want to talk to me about like a live action feature film? Surely there's someone better. And I almost kind of talked myself out of, talked my way out of the job. But um, they said, come in and pitch us some ideas for it. Now you know what it is. And I went back in and John Knoll was in there. Again, any, anyone who knows the Star Wars universe, you walk into a room and John Knoll's there. You're instantly kind of like, a, ah, like yeah. this guy's a legend. Yeah. And John was the guy who came up with the original idea for the story. And so it was me and John and Kiri and I can't remember who else may have been in the room, but I basically pitched him like my whole, my whole idea was like, basically this is a world war two men on a mission movie. Like I love those movies when I was a kid, I love guns and Navarone. I love the dirty dozen, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Kelly's heroes, uh, where Eagles dare. And I was thinking particularly about where Eagles dare. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but Clint Eastwood and Richard Burton play these, um, you know, allied soldiers that have to kind of dress up like the Nazis in order to infiltrate like a German, you know, castle fortress on top of a mountain. And it's all very cool. And I, was, I remember thinking like, you know, they, you can imagine like our, you know, our rebel heroes having to dress up like Imperial officers to infiltrate a base and that kind of stuff. And it was drawing on all yeah. of those kind of classic World War II influences. And then I also meant, the other thing I mentioned was Zero Dark Thirty. I thought, I thought like this movie could have like a Zero Dark Thirty kind mm -hmm. of vibe. And I imagine Jin as this kind of character who's much like um, Jessica Chastain's character and the one person going you know she's saying you know osama bin Laden's in this house you got to listen to me and take this seriously i imagine Jin is the one person in the rebellion saying the rebels the, the, the empire is building this thing and you have to take me seriously i've got all this evidence that the empire is building this thing that would come to be known as the death star i need to take me seriously that was kind of my my way in and again left the meeting without knowing anything it's not like they hired me in the room or anything but then they did come back and asked me to, and then I had, they wanted me to meet with Gareth and eventually with Kathy and eventually, you know, and then the, the head people at Disney. And it was all these kind of levels and levels of kind of getting signed off on by different people. And finally, um, I got the job. And I found out subsequently after I got the job, John showed me the book that he used to pitch Kathy Kennedy on making the movie in the first place. And it had all these references in it. And I was flipping through it. It was Dirty Dozen and Kelly's Heroes and Zero Duck 30. Oh, cool. And I just, it was just all the same. We were just on the same page in terms of what we thought like the cinematic reference points for the movie were. So I just got lucky in that my initial instinct for what the movie could be dovetailed with what John originally had in mind. And that's why they said, yeah, this guy. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you just gotta be in the right place at the right time, I guess. And Jin, Jin Urso as a character, was that something that was in, in John's kind of high concept or was that something that you had brought to the table with, with her and her father being part of the, uh, you know, empire, um, you know, like engineering team actually putting all this stuff together. So it, so it, it came in stages. So John had the idea of Jin as this person who leads the, the um, you know, the rebel effort to steal the the plans. And I was the one who kind of brought the, the Zero Dark, again, all the Zero Dark 30 stuff in the end didn't really make it into the movie. We kind of took it in a different direction. But 
Um, the, the, the one big contribution that I would say that myself and, and I, I think Gareth made, because I remember we kind of came, came up with it collaboratively, was the idea that it was Jin's father who was the scientist who was co-opted and built into building the Death Star. And we kind of liked the idea there was almost this kind of element of like Greek tragedy to it. And it almost kind of felt like saga. We knew it wasn't a saga film, but how do you make it feel like it has that same energy? You know, all the saga films are obviously about family, right? It's a dynastic tragedy of the Skywalkers. And it's much about, you know, it's, it's very much about kind of Luke Skywalker kind of redeeming the sins of the father and, and, and you know, re redeeming the father himself. And that we, we like the idea of that, of that having this similar energy, that the father had been forced to do this terrible thing to build the Death Star, and now it fell to the daughter to kind of redeem his sins by destroying it. But I love this idea. I'm very, I'm, I used to be very, very online. I used to be on all the message boards. And a common meme, as I'm sure you know, is people used to love to say, well, if the Empire is so smart, how did they wind up with this ridiculously easy to exploit floor you know, in the middle of this massive construction project? Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of people just always thought it was an oversight. But I always loved the idea that it wasn't. It was a deliberate, it was put there deliberately, as a, literally as an act of rebellion. That this, mm. the, the, this, this good man, this scientist who had been co-opted and forced by the Empire to build this monstrous weapon that he never wanted to build, had, had decided that he was going to get the better of them and, and, and very cleverly engineer in a way that was so subtle that no, no, Empire, no Imperial engineer would spot it. But he would build this exhaust port, this floor, you know, this kind of one kill button that you could push if you just knew where it was. And he had done that, but then the next part was, well, I need to kind of, I need to tell the, re the rebels where it is, and that means getting them the plant so they can exploit this floor that I built into it for them. And I just that, that to me is still like one of my proudest things that we brought mm. into the Star Wars canon was was kind of retconning or reinventing what why the, the exhaust port was there that it wasn't a floor, it wasn't just a fluke. It was it came from again, it was kind of the original act of rebellion was mm. to design this floor into the Death Star, and then it fell to Jin and the heroes of the movie to kind of finish. You know, he kind of hands the baton to you. I've taken you this far. I built the floor, but now you have to get the plans to the, re the rebels so they can exploit it. And that's obviously what turned out to be the story of the movie. So John worked very closely with George uh, on the prequels. Um, did George ever have a say in Rogue One? Did he ever come on set? And, and I know that. Uh, so I never met George, and I'm in a way I'm almost glad that I didn't because he is one of those people that I would just be like, just melt into a puddle if I met him. Gareth was very interested in meeting him because he, again, he idolizes George. And George, I know, did eventually come to the set long after I left. There is a, there is a funny story attached to that. I remember when so Gareth told me about this. They gave George a tour of the you know the Pinewood, you know the the the, the model shop and all that because George mm -hmm. obviously very interested in all that stuff, and they showed him all these models and. Um, Gareth showed him the U-wing that they they had built this beautiful model of the U-wing yeah. uh, that they uh, were going to paint up and and use in the film. And uh, George looked around, and anytime George would like look at like a piece of art on the wall or look at a model and go, "I like that. That's cool." Gareth was like, "Well, that's in the movie now. Like conversation over. We're putting that in." <laughs> yeah, and yeah. And George was kind of like just like just by subtly kind of going, "That I like that." Just just this kind of like almost kind of royal approval that he would yeah, give yeah, things yeah. they immediately kind of showed up in the in the movie um but he took an interest in the u-wing and he really liked it and gareth at the end said would you before you leave like would you autograph would you sign something for us like just leave your mark on on this and george signed the u-wing the problem is it was, it was actually it was actually a model that still had to be painted and but, oh, but, no. but since george had signed it they were like okay well that's not we're not painting over that and they set that one aside and basically had to build a new ewing model oh, from cool. scratch because no one was going to paint over george's of autograph cool. i thought that was cool the the um you know i liked rogue one um quite a bit um and mm -hmm. one of the things that i you know that i i really love about rogue one is is that opening scene where you have um uh you know krennic and the father uh you know uh, talking to each other and like in that dialogue you get this sense that they've really known each other for a long 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 time it's like definitely two people whether they're friends or not you can tell that at one point they were friendly but regardless of that they have tons of history together was that yeah. was that was that something that 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 you guys gave some kind of like fun talk behind the scenes about what their relationship was prior to the film starting so that scene is something that went by like, you know, like any movie, or certainly with this one, went through a lot of evolution. But it was actually the very first idea that Gareth and I had for how to open the movie. Um, and we talked a lot about Inglorious Bastards.
And if you remember mm. the opening scene of that movie, you'll know immediately what the similarities are. You yeah, know, yeah, Christoph yeah, Waltz, yeah. the Nazi, comes to the French farmhouse and everyone's terrified. And yeah, it was yeah. we, we wanted to kind of capture that vibe. And it's very, you know, and that, a lot of people didn't capture it. But as soon as they say Glorious Past, they go, oh, yeah, like you can totally see the, see the influence there now. We kind of wanted to have that kind of opening. And so the, actually the very, very first scene I wrote in the first draft of the screenplay was that scene, the idea that yeah. Jen, a young Jen and her mother and father were living um, – uh, you know, in this you know distant farmhouse on a remote planet, and that Krennic basically came and 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 tracked them down because they needed this engineer to help them fix this problem. The, the Death Star production had basically stalled, and they needed an, an expert to come and help them, you know, fix the the problems they were having. That was that was all the very first stuff that I wrote. And I remember when the trailer came out, mm. and I saw that image of the Krennic shuttle float flying over Jens as she's running through the grass. That was one of the very first scenes I wrote, and to see it actually brought to the screen, even just on a YouTube trailer that I was watching, like I cried. It was so emotional. Oh my god! Like this, this stuff is becoming real. But again, yeah. just to kind of speak to the collaborative nature of it all, in the version of the script that I wrote, Krennic and Jin's father didn't have a, a pre-existing relationship. They they, they just knew that he was a he he was known to be a, a very uh, he was an expert engineer that that they needed to bring in expert extra people, and Krennic was just going around kind of grabbing you know, expert engineers to kind of, you know, Shanghai them into Imperial service, basically. It was like, this is not a choice. You're coming with us. Right. Um, and then it was the work of, I think mostly Chris White's, then also Tony Gilroy and some of the other writers that worked on it uncredited. Um, that, that pre, the idea that he was, uh, the, that there was a pre-existing relationship there. That was something that got layered on after me, but the, the basics of it, the, you know, the glorious bastards, the yeah. farmhouse of it all, Krennic coming to basically press ganger, uh, an engineer into Imperial service to build this terrible weapon. That was all there from the very beginning. Literally one of the very first things Gareth and I came up with. Yeah, it was such a great opening scene. Um, you know, the acting in the scene is great. It's a really great tone setter. Um, you know, Krennic's become kind of one of my favorite characters in all of the sequel films or in all the Disney era films. Um, and that opening scene is, is beautiful with Michael. Like people, like when the film first came out, uh, people were a, a little bit down on Michael Giacchino's score. I actually really like Dude, Michael Giacchino's score yeah. in the, you know, like in the film, especially in that one opening scene. Um, and then throughout the picture, of course, but in any case, Theory, you were going to say something? Uh, yeah. So, well, I have a few questions. Did you have any other, um, actually, let me pivot to Andor. What would you like to see in the show? Um, I feel like a lot of people are sort of sleeping on the show. They don't realize how cool this show could be because it's in the time of the Empire. It's essentially in the time of Rogue One um, or around that. And we can see so much of Vader. We can see so much of the Emperor. We can see so much of what the Empire is really doing. And, of course, more of Krennic because he's still alive. So, so I, so one of one of the rules that I have myself, and it's actually kind of a, like an informal Lucasfilm rule, is like they always say, like, it's okay to, to look forward. Sorry, it's okay to look back and talk about stuff that's been done, but like try to avoid looking forward and speculating, speculating. about like okay. what you're going to see. I got into trouble years ago. I was doing interviews for um, the Star Wars Blu-ray release, sorry, the Rogue One Blu-ray release. And mm -hmm. I, I ended up doing like 30 of these international press outlet calls, like back to back rolling. Okay, coming right. up next, Gary, this is like such and such from some French TV station or whatever, and they want to ask you some questions. And you've got to be really careful because, again, once you're in the Star Wars universe, anything you say, and I've seen this happen to me over and over again, will, can make headlines without you realizing it. Sure. I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you an example. So they said to me, oh, so this is the first, this is even before Solo was announced. They so were like, oh, so Rogue One's the first of presumably now more standalone films what what do you think the future of the standalone films is going to be and the mistake i made was i said look i tried to be very clear with them on the phone but again it, it always gets twisted i said listen i'm I, i'm done with that well i did go on to do more work for lucasfilm but at the time i was done i said look, I, I have no idea i have no involvement with that i i, I can just I'll, I'll tell you what i would like to see as a fan i hope that they tell stories um I hope they bring new characters in and find ways, ways to kind of broaden the universe and like tell and, and not just keep telling stories about the characters we already know. Like, I'd like to see new characters. Uh, and, but that's just me speaking as a fan. What do I know? I don't know what they're doing. The next right. day that was written up as Rogue One writer lays out the future of the standalone films. Oh it's going to be all right, new characters. Right. And now I've got Lucasfilm on the phone. I'm like, that's not what I said. You know, the press person will tell you who was on the call. That's not what I said. <sighs> but it gets so twisted. And so when you ask me a question like that, what do you want to see from an Andor show? 
I'll, I'll leave it at this. I'm a Star Wars fan. I hope it's cool, but I'm not going to get into any details. Any time I talk about anything speculatively that might be coming down the pipe, it's so easy for people to think that I'm that I'm speaking from a position of knowledge or I, I don't know the first thing about what's going on with that show. I'm not involved in it. I, I know what you know, Diego Luna. Um, it's a prequel. I know nothing else. So okay. I hope for a good show, but it's, as far as details are concerned, I, I know you probably, you guys probably know more than I do. I'll okay. speculate so, for so a second. Tomorrow I can, I can make a video saying uh, Gary Witta confirms yeah, yeah. Vader. Is yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Gary Witta confirms Krennic's appearance. Gary Witta confirms he hopes that the Rogue One TV show will be good. There you go. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's a good headline. Um, you said you had a few questions. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go for it, man. We'll go one. Yeah, uh, yeah, the... Um, the the other thing about um, Rogue One that when I was in the movie theater, it, it was a sort of a mind bending moment for me was, you know, when I saw Tarkin up on the screen and when I just couldn't tell, you know, like I saw it at the Cine Cinerama Dome in Los Angeles, um, you know, which is a pretty impressive screen to see it on in the first place. And I had good seats and, you know, prepared and, you know, every, you know, my mental state was proper. But the first time you see um, um, Tarkin up there talking and moving around and doing his Tarkin things, my brain exploded. Was this a conscious decision that you guys made in the writing to say, hey, we're going to do this crazy special effects sort of pioneering element of, of fully realizing this person back in live action for the first time, you know, uh, forever? Or, or, or was this, again, something that happened as the iteration went forward? I mean, so I, as, as, as I remember, I was the one who said initially, I feel like Tarkin's got to be in the movie. You know, this is the movie set basically literally the day before A New Hope, where Tarkin's yeah. walking around on the Death Star. Clearly, clearly he owns the place. He's the top man. If we're going to have scenes, you know, on, on and around the Death Star, and you know, we're talking about the building of the Death Star, how can Tarkin suddenly show up the next day? And now he's the most important person. Like I feel like he needs to, have, for continuity, he needs to be present in the Rogue One story. Obviously, Peter Cushing is long since passed. How do you how do you do that? And so it was it, that was actually one of the initial conversations we had with with John Knoll, who's kind of doing double duty both as a storyteller on the movie because he wrote the initial idea for the film, but is also heading up the visual effects team that's going to realize all this stuff. And I said, well, here's the issue. I feel like Tarkin needs to be in the movie. How how would we even do that? And he's like, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, just just write, write him the way you would want him to be in the movie and ILM will figure it out. And in the initial, I didn't fully trust him. Not, not that I shouldn't trust him, but like, I just, like, it just didn't even seem possible. And so when I wrote Tarkin originally into the movie, I actually tried to make ILM's job as easy as possible. Like he wasn't in many scenes. He was always kind of in shadow. Like, I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to make this easy for you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and when they, saw, they, when, when they saw that, they were like, don't, hold back on it just to put him in the movie you way you want to put him in don't put him in the movie the way you think we can do it let us worry about that and i was like well how are you thinking about doing this like is it going to be like a lookalike actor are you going to pull old footage look and then by this point john knew he's like no it's going to be all cg and i'm like yeah. are you sure you guys can pull that off and john just gave me this look like do you know what we do here like that's what we do at <laughs> right. ilm like we figure out how to do impossible shit <laughs> every day so right. just let us worry about that. Yeah. And so I wrote him into the movie. And again, his presence and scenes in the movie changed with subsequent iterations, but he was always in the movie from day one. Um, and I remember sometime later seeing some of the raw footage from Tarkin's. And I, I imagine you've probably seen this, but I can't remember the name of the actress guy. Something is this brilliant British actor mm. who has very similar features to Tarkin, kind of a gaunt, very thin, you know, has this kind of yeah. regal English bearing and he does the voice as well for Tarkin in the movie and he does it brilliantly. And I remember the first time that I saw is it's, it's guy, it, it's, it's this actor, his guy, I'm blanking on his surname, but he has all the, like, the, the, the head rig and the cameras around him and all mm -hmm. the green motion capture dots. And he's full frame, like right up on the camera. Like, man, you guys are not giving yourself any, yeah, like, you're not brilliant. trying to hide this at all. You're putting him front and center. And John was like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, and it was all fully CG in the end, and I do think they did an incredible job with it. It really is uncanny. I remember the Guy way Henry. They did, yeah, Guy Henry. That's it. Brilliant, brilliant guy. I and mean, if you if you Google an image of him, you see, oh yeah, he's kind of got like Tarkin esque features. You can see why they cast him, and that's Guy Henry's voice as well. It sounds exactly like Peter Cushing. Like he just nailed it. 
And I remember looking at that footage, and you'll remember this. That you said the first time you saw him, it's done for you. See him first from behind, right? And it's yeah. dark in, and you think, ah, oh, they're not going to show his face. Though. There's they're no way. Of, but no, they do. They go full on. You go, oh shit, they did it, and it's really amazing. They obviously did it with Leia as well at the end. The one thing that I remember that I thought was amazing about that was it, it, this is just a, a, an amazing example of ingenuity in the visual effects business, and also just what a legend John Knoll is in the visual effects business was. Um, do you remember the Val Kilmer movie Top Secret? Of course. So Peter Cushing's in that movie for like two minutes, right? He plays like this kind of stuffy old librarian. And mm. one of the big jokes in the movie, one of the big visual gags is when you first see Peter Cushing's character in the film, he's looking through a magnifying glass and his eye is like hugely magnified through the glass. And mm. the joke is when he takes the magnifying glass down, his eye just really is that big. And it's just <laughs> right, like a cool right. visual gag. And in order to do that effect, and this is back in the like the late 80s or whenever it is they made Top Secret, in order to do that gag, they they did a full head life cast of Peter Cushing so that they could build that prosthetic eye onto his face. Oh wow. John, who we need we need like a we need like a 3D model of Peter Cushing's actual head. Where can we find one? When when would wow. he ever have done that? Well, he did it for Top Secret. And because John knows every wow. single person in the in the visual effects business, he found that head, that that, that prosthetic mold of Peter Cushing's head that was. Yeah, I remember he had it. He was in his office. Like Peter Cushing's head is just sitting there on his desk, and like that's the creepiest shit I've ever seen. But it's wow. incredible. And they found that, and they three D scanned it, and they used that as the basis for the facial reconstruction they did for Peter Cushing in the movie. I just thought, I always thought that was brilliant. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah, I that didn't is know that either. really, that's really, crazy. really cool. Like when I saw that movie, I was like, to me, it felt the most George Lucas-esque because you know, George Lucas, his films were always not only about story, great storytelling and all and great acting and all whatever. You know, they were, you know, they also had this larger responsibility to the entire kind of film medium to right. like push things forward. And with Rogue One, I got that sense, especially focused around the realization of Tarkin. Uh, it's really great insight you just gave me. I, did, I had no idea that yeah. they went on this Indiana Jones adventure to find this mold cast of, of a movie from like 1983 or four or whatever. I mean, the, the interesting thing, I don't even think, even think it was like as intrepid as Indiana Jones. John just knows everyone in the business. I don't know exactly how he right. did it. There's probably, <laughs> there's probably two phone calls and that, and that, and that bus was on his desk the next day. Cause when John Noll <laughs> asks someone in the visual effects business for a favor, they're going to do it. And so again, that's just a, one of the, again, there's this incredible kind of privilege that comes with, working on Star Wars, especially if you've done it, if you're someone like John Knoll or Dennis Murin or whatever, like everybody idolizes you. And if he calls right. up saying, hey, do you still have that Peter Cushing head on a shelf somewhere? They're like, I'll get it to you overnight. And that's kind of what happened. <laughs> right. It was amazing. That's cool. That's really cool. Power. Unlimited power. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with the scenes for Vader, I'd love to know more. If there, Were there any scenes that um, that you wrote in there that weren't shot or weren't filmed? Or were there scenes that they were debating on putting in that they cut out or whatever i don't think so i mean the the big scene with vader in the hallway was something that got added on after me and i think you know mm -hmm. to me purchase again I, I, although i'm biased to me is one of the top 10 great all-time great mm -hmm. star wars moments i think I if you're going to make a list of like top 10 scenes in this in all the star wars movies that raid in the hallway has got to yeah. be there i take yeah. no credit for it i had a similar idea i wanted to put vader in combat on the beaches on scarif I, I, oh my there was, god originally there was this that idea beautiful. and i pitched it i pitched beautiful. it in the room but like it didn't go over and we never put it in a script but the idea was basically... They didn't go um, for it? What the it hell? Just, you, know, you pitch a million ideas and some get picked up and some don't. It's, I, I could have pushed for it more, but I didn't. But the idea was the Rebels... Jin had gone up into the tower to transmit the plans and the Rebels had basically kind of bunkered in around the base of the tower to prevent any Imperials following her up. Yeah. And they really needed to take out the take out that tower. Uh, but the, the, again, it was, they, they were all kind of like trenched in. And you know, the scene was basically like, Lord Vader, you know, we can't get any of our troops through because the rebels have like put everything around the entrance to the bunker. And he was like, put me on that beach. I'll open the door for you. Oh my God. And dude. that was going to be the idea of him. Like it's basically the same thing as the hallway, but on the beach, just like, just like a one man Normandy invasion and just taking out the entire rebel garrison. Oh. Again, I, I, I in retrospect, I, I, I should have pushed harder for it. But again, I think they actually ended up doing something even better because that scene in the hallway, is so much more. It's almost like a scene from a horror movie. Of course, you know, yeah. like this, it was this, amazing. This thing is just going to murder. Yeah. It's like you know, what what I thought was interesting about it was where the original idea for the beach 
scene came from. And I think the hallway scene came from a similar place was the argument I made was that we've seen Vader in combat in various different ways. We've mm -hmm. seen him fight his equal, right? We've seen him fight Obi-Wan Kenobi in kind of a one-on-one -on -one battle. Mm -hmm. We've seen him fight people or we've seen him deal with people that are obviously like easy for him to toy with, like a force choke, like find your lack of faith. You serve. Like, we've seen him do that. Like that's nothing to him. Yeah. But I always wonder, what does the asymmetric battle look like? One Vader, one Sith Lord against, you know, a hundred heavily armed rebel soldiers. Who wins yes. that? Well, obviously Vader does, but what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Well, now we know because they did the hallway scene and I just thought that was absolutely incredible. Um, but in terms the of the contribution, so, Again, it was one of the things that we did very early on. I remember sitting around with Gareth and him saying, like, I feel like we need like a really like iconic visual connection point to the original films, like Jin and Kren. All these these are all characters, but like people, Star Wars people don't know who they are. We're introducing them for the first time. We need like an iconic, not just the Death Star, but a character that right. actually fits that that the, the people are, oh shit, he's in the movie. Yeah. Tarkin does, is cool, but doesn't really get you all the way there. It's kind of a secondary character. So again, Vader, we know is, is a big part of the Death Star as well. We know he's there on the Death Star the day after. So like, what can we do with Vader? We know, and we know that he's tra literally tracking down the Death Star plans in the first scene of the movie. So it makes perfect, it wasn't really like, we didn't have to shoehorn him in. It made sense that he would be in the film. Um, and so the idea was what, well, what purpose can he serve? And again, one of the other, one of my other like proud contributions to the film is like, was Mustafar and putting him there. Like I want to see. Oh, that's awesome. Gareth was really Gareth. One of one of Gareth's favorite scenes in Star Wars is the scene in Empire when you know the Imperial officer walks in and you catch that glimpse at mm -hmm. the back of his head as the helmet's coming on. Remember the first time we saw it? Oh shit! Like what does he really look like under there? Mm -hmm. Like the right. first time, like seeing like the actual organic Vader under all the armor. And it's like I was like, what can we do in that space? Like could we blow that up and do a better version of that? And so the so I, I, was, I had, always had this idea that you know especially after Revenge of the Sith like we know just how physically destroyed he is like there's so little of him like mm -hmm. this is the interesting thing that you often don't think about but you know he's like this seven foot tall guy in this like black armor but what's underneath there is like virtually any human being it's what Obi Wan says it right he's more machine now than man yeah. there's there's like, he's got no limbs he's all burned up like it's almost like the stump of organic matter that's stuck in the middle of all this armor. And I kind of like, I like, so they did that underneath all that armor, like Anakin Skywalker was still there, basically. We know that, right? Because he comes back at the end. We know Anakin Skywalker is never truly gone mm -hmm. from, you know, whatever spirit is inside of there. Right. And I, I, I like the idea of showing that. So like put him in a back to tank, similar, again, kind of matching up what you saw with Luke in Empire. Put him in a back to tank. The, the pitch behind it was, listen, he's so physically ruined and wrecked. The arm, we know the armor keeps him alive. I like the idea that just every now and again, he has to kind of take all the armor off and go into and some kind of rejuvenate like his organic self, like go into a back, like once a month, he has to have like a star day, basically yeah. right. like rejuvenate himself. Yeah. And I wanted to remind people that like, there really is almost nothing of the human part of him left. Yeah. So let's see that. And I remember that, that's actually one of the scenes that I wrote that is almost completely unchanged from the original script was Krennic walking into the, the chamber and seeing that just seeing what almost, almost looks like a, I think the way I originally pitched it was like a, like, you know, see like a, like a carnival freak show has like a deformed baby in a jar or whatever. Yeah. I wanted it to look like that, but like the Star Wars version of it. And then, you know, he, he comes out and all the steam and the armor and everything. Yeah. Um, that was, that was a big part of it. And then the other part was like, where does Vader go on his day off? Like, what does he, like, he, he can't just live on a Star Destroyer or the Death Star. Like, where does he go? And what does that tell you about him? And, you know, obviously we know that Mustafar is, is a historically significant place because it's basically where Anakin died and Darth Vader was born, right on the on the on that that beach of lava. Mm -hmm. And I, we never really kind of got that deep into it, but I love the idea that he chose to build his temple there, his fortress, whatever you want to call it. As like, it, it, I don't think Darth Vader put it there. I think Anakin put it there. And there's this idea that like in a longer version of the movie, you might have had a shot where Vader is kind of looking out over those lakes of lava, like literally over that that area where Darth Vader died and Anakin Skywalker was born, yeah. just having a quiet moment thinking, what the hell happened to me? Right. Like, who have I become? And again, yeah. those are the private thoughts that he's having that he would never express to anyone, but that's the part of him that Luke's able to reach yeah. you know, many years later. Um, but just this idea that he, it was a, it was a different environment. I, like, I love the fact that this is something they added later, but I love the idea that when you go to all the different planets, they put the name up, you know. Um, yeah, it was cool. Having four... Uh, whatever it might be. But then when you go to Mustafar, they don't tell you what it is. Like they let the fans figure, oh shit, this is Mustafar. Yeah. And right, I, thought, right. I, I thought it was a nice it, way to 
to kind of same combine. thing in Rise of Skywalker, I think actually, right? Yeah, maybe I, I don't I don't recall, yeah, yeah. but um, mm. uh, I thought that was a nice way to kind of connect. If you think of like Rogue One as this movie that canonically sits between the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy, you know, bringing back Jimmy Smith as Bail Organa, bringing back you know Genevieve mm -hmm. as Mon Mothma, and and I personally I'm not a fan of the prequels, but that doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge them in this in the canonical storytelling. And so mm. having Mustafar there having some of those other prequel characters there. I just felt it was a nice way for Rogue One to form a kind of a connected bridge between the two trilogies. The, yeah, the, really one, tied it in. One, one thing that I really enjoyed about that scene, and I actually really enjoyed it in the trailer as well, and talk about speculation, my brain was just spinning everywhere. When you first see Vader's uh, keeper, I'm not sure what his name is in canon now, but like, you know, now you know that he's this old man that kind of presumably takes care of Vader, but in the original trailer, you kind of just see this guy looking kind of like he's dressed up like as a like a Sith walking yeah. into the back to tank, and you're seeing like the Vader in the back to tank. Vignette. What, what Vignette is his name? Yeah, yeah. What what's was there any kind of backstory to who he was and what he did? I mean, because in the film, you know, you don't really get anything about who he is. No, a lot a lot of a, a lot of the really like deep back like those deep back character story and things like that a lot of that stuff's not in the script so i remember as, as i wrote it i think it was just like he had attendance right and who knows right. they could have been right. ugnaughts who knows they could have yeah. been like you know, in the end they ended up being these cool kind of sith looking dudes but the idea was like again someone has to someone has to take him in and out of the tank right it's not all automated it's, yeah. it's basically like the idea of like a billion like a dying billionaire who has like a private medical team sure. who attends him 24 7 right mm -hmm. was the idea i never really thought about who they would be i think it, I, I think it literally says like his attendants or whatever a lot of that stuff in terms of their names and the backstory and all the stuff you read when you go get like the visual you know dictionary I, a lot of that stuff gets added on like later like even mm -hmm. after the film is done like they'll continue to build right. Because in the script, you don't need any of that stuff. I don't need to know who this guy is. He's in yeah. he's in and out of the film in 10 seconds. So I don't need to go on a one page, sure. you know, here's who this guy is. You know, that just gets in the way of the movie. Well, they, they, can, they can add Wars. all that stuff after the fact. Yeah, they have a backstory in literally every single so being they do. in the galaxy. They do. And almost all of that will get added on by people like Pablo Hidalgo and Leland and the people that kind of do the, right. you know, do, do you know, add on all the extra stuff. It can't, you know, they're obviously using the film as a guide and we might often have conversations with them about stuff that's not in the film, but obviously, you know, has, can be expanded for people that want to, you know, for, again, there's plenty of star Wars fans. Like who's that guy? He's in the right, movie right. for two seconds, but I want to know a million things about right. him. He's that's, dressed like a Sith with Vader. Who the hell Lucas is that? Film, Lucasfilm know that there are fans that have those questions. And so the books and the ancillary material that gets built around the movie provide those answers, but it doesn't need to be in the movie. The movie has got to keep moving. Sure. For uh, for the mold of Vader when he came out of the the spa day, and which which I I gotta add in Legends, um, you, you hit the nail on the head with uh, with that. With, he would have to be scrubbed of necrotic flesh all the time by these droids. So it's like when he goes into that Bacta, I never even really thought of him going into a Bacta. So the fact that you put it in there like that, it's it's cool. It's like he needs to revive almost or like rejuvenate after you know a month's work of just yeah, it was really. And, then, and there's all kinds of like nerdy cool stuff that you can that you can pontificate about but really what i wanted it to do was just again now we have the luxury of telling a story that's in the middle of a wider story that we already know the end to right we know yeah. that, that that luke's right anakin skywalker as much as vader tries to deny it anakin skywalker is never truly dead and we know that he comes back at the end yeah. and so i wanted to, I, I really wanted to kind of have this idea of that like, don't forget we we know the ending but don't forget vader is still just this broken tragic crippled human underneath all of that scary armor when you strip all that away he's just this desperately tragic sad figure um and that was that and that was a way just to kind of remind people of you know the vulnerable sad character that's underneath the armor as a fan i'm really really thankful that you did that it's a really cool scene for the mold um or, or the bust or whatever did you have to take um a mold of hayden christensen's face because it's pretty uncanny why would we have taken a mold of Hayden Christensen's face? Well, because when it was coming out, it looked a lot like Hayden. Oh, I, you know what? I, I, it, I never, it never even occurred to me. I don't even remember like how much of a look you get at his face. I, I, I mean, I've you seen get a decent amount, times. but then in the um, behind the scenes, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if they ever did anything as like going back to molds or references or things like that. I know that uh, I'm, I, I suspect, and again, I'm just speculating here. I suspect that they when they were designing what burned up you know back to vader yeah. looked like yeah. um they 
they obviously, obviously already knew that Hayden Christensen played that role and they obviously were not going to make it look like someone else. So I suspect that they tried to make it, you know, be consistent with the look that we know Hayden Christensen had, had as Anakin Skywalker, but I don't yeah. know to what lengths they may have gone to to, to get get there. Fair I never. I, I'm going to go back and look now. That's interesting. I'm going to go back and look at that scene and well, see how much yeah. Hayden might be recognizable in that shot. I'm going to bring up some of the photos. Mark, why don't you shoot a question and I'll um, I'll bring up yeah, the, you know, the behind the scenes stuff. You could see his face. For me, another thing about the film that I just enjoyed so much, and I think it really captured, like you said, that kind of echo of Star Wars was um and i'm gonna butcher the android's name but uh you know the um the humor of k k1 so k k1 k2 so k2 so um that character was absolutely fantastic you know this idea of a reprogrammed imperial droid that was now serving uh you know the rebels and the humor that uh the actor who plays him brought to the table was just absolutely incredible was was that part of the original design to have this kind of comic relief in the form of K2SO? Um, so K2SO, and I talk about this often, is a perfect example of how everything that you see in Star Wars is a result of, of a collaboration and a kind of a baton passing exercise. Um, K2SO has many fathers. Uh, John Knoll is the first one because he was the one who originally came up with the idea of having, you know, every good rebel team needs a droid, right? And so Originally, um, you can go if you go back and look at the art of Rogue One. You can see like some of the very, very early drawings of Rogue uh, of K two. Looks quite different, I think, than what we eventually settled on. But the original idea was he was just he was called he was called a logistics droid. He was an Imperial mm. logistics a, a rebel logistics droid. And originally, it just basically looked like C three PO, I think, but like skinned black, like black metal instead of gold metal, like shiny black metal. Um, and he didn't have much of a personality in, again, because John just wrote a very thinly sketched outline. He didn't necessarily explain a lot about who, Jin and some of the others, but the Android is just like a robot. Like how interesting can that be? But one of the things we know, and one of the things that John did that I thought was fascinating was, you know, we know that humor is an integral part of Star Wars, right? There's so many great funny moments. John, in fact, did an amazing piece of research that he did uh, where he did a whole presentation on, uh, his theory of like humor in Star Wars and like when it works and when it doesn't. Hmm. And the, the the basic thesis, like the, the bottom line conclusion of it all was it works really well when it comes from character. It doesn't work as well when it comes from slapstick. So like the, the example that he gave was like just tiny moments, you know, like when Han Solo first meets C-3PO in the docking bay and 3PO mm -hmm. just says, hello, sir. And Solo just kind of like rolls his eyes like, yeah. Me, like I'm gonna yeah. put up with this dude now. Like yeah. just a tiny moment, but it makes you laugh. And then an example of maybe humor that works less well is you know Jar Jar slipping in shit, you know, in the pod racing pits or whatever. Like it's just slapstick. And so if it comes from character, oh, with the mama jokes. Yeah. So if it comes from character, it tends to work better. And so, and one of the things again that we know that's kind of established in the spirit of Star Wars is that the droids are always a great um, catalyst for comedy. C three sure. obviously three PO and R 2s relationship, perfect right, example. And that comes that. from the, from from the hidden fortress, um, right? The two guys, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. So George, George Lucas's reference for the droids are the comic relief in the hidden fortress, right? Um, so and that, and that ended up setting the the pattern for like droids always being, and it's continued to this day. I mean, look at Ch uh, Chopper. And Chopper's like my favorite character to write for yeah. Star Wars Rebels because uh, he's hilarious, and again, you can have fun with the droids. And so I was looking at K2 and he was a little bit of a blank slate. I thought, how can I make him more interesting? And the main idea that I pitched was, and rather than being a rebel droid, let's have him being an imperial droid that they captured and reprogrammed. Oh, nice. And now he works on the rebel side because I just felt like there was all kinds of interesting stuff that would come out of that. And in earlier versions of the story, there was there was more that we did with that. The idea that like a lot of the rebels didn't really trust him is like, it, you know, how yeah. do we know that he's like fully reprogrammed? He might still be imperial yeah. underneath. They never really trusted him. He had kind of, you remember like when um, Russell Crowe scrapes off the mark of the Legion in Gladiator because yes. he's kind of renounced his masters. I always like this idea. There was an idea, there was a version, I think, in the early in the early part of this, in the early draft of the script that I did where he had scraped off all of his Imperial markings because he didn't want them on him anymore. But then when he had to go Imperial, when he had to go infiltrate the Imperial base, he had to paint them all back on, you know, to look like a freshened up Imperial droid. And he hated having to do it because he had renounced the Empire. The where that all came from from a character standpoint was the idea that like imperial droids aren't funny, right? They're just like yes, master. Like they just kind of because imperial right. the imperials don't take any shit. Like you just do what you're told. And I always imagine they have these kind of behavioral restraining bolts 
attached to them that prevent them from being funny or talking back to their masters or whatever. But when the rebels captured K2, I, I, again, this is all just in my canon, but it informed everything that I had wrote for that character that they had basically switched, they, they had flipped that switch to allow him to kind of have like full freedom of expression. And they had kind of like taken the shackles off him essentially behaviorally. And I kind of felt like K2 is like, now that I can, now that I can finally speak my mind, I'm gonna, I'm, you're going to get my opinion every time, whether you want it or not. And I, so the idea of him being this kind of sarcastic and constantly kind of talking back to people and giving them grief. It's like, I remember there was, there was a scene early in, early in my draft where like Jin was like, K2, can you move that crate for me? He's like, you move it. You've got arms. What are you going to yeah. for? He's like, he was just like right. constantly like giving everyone shit. Like, if I, I don't have to do anything. I'm free. And he loved that. Um, but it, it, so John created K2. I gave him a personality. So I'm kind of like father number two, the kind of the impro recaptured Imperial droid who's kind of rediscovering his, you know, his freedom. Um, and then Chris and Tony and other writers continue to kind of, you know, gave him more of a voice, more of an attitude. And then Alan Tudyk comes along and gives him the literal voice and plays the character. Yeah. Hal Hickel and the team at ILM actually design the character and make his eyes move. And every single part of that is a part of creating a living, what, you know, tricks you into believing is a living being. So it's in the writing, it's in the CG, it's in the performance. In, in, every, in every single aspect, you kind of see how K2 evolves from, you know, a very thinly sketched character on, on the initial document to, you know, a character that now is like, I think a lot of people's favorite character in Rogue One. Yeah, yeah, that's a point well taken. I like that. If you uh, check my screen, I'll bring up the um, the images that I saw from the behind the scenes. You can see him just right there. I'll try to zoom in. Okay. What are we looking at here? You can see the bust of Vader that kind of I thought. Oh, like I pain. see. Oh, that's and him in the you... tank. Yeah. Yeah, and then if you scroll down, there's also this concept design right. that I felt looked a lot like the Hayden too. But yeah, I mean, yeah. maybe to me that just looks very generic. That could be anyone, but yeah, certainly it's not like it couldn't be Hayden, right? That's the one thing they had. To like, it's not like it can't be him. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I guess it's a burnt bald dude with a mask on, so it could really be right. anybody. Right. <laughs> Figured I'd ask. Looks like somebody you see in a sex dungeon. <laughs> Perhaps yeah. maybe that's the version we should have done. Vader's sex dungeon would have been an interesting way to <laughs> that go. That could be the next spin-off story group, though. When Disney runs out of ideas, two thousand one hundred. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mark, you got any more questions? Oh, I got, I got plenty. I'm sure. You know, do do you have anything we're, you want to talk about? Not particularly. I feel like a lot of my questions were answered. I'm just enjoying shooting the shit right now. Um, well, look, we're coming we're, up on 50 minutes and we want, yeah, yeah, we want so, to be respectful of your time. I'm good. I, I'm happy to talk until you guys are, are done. I'm enjoying. Yeah. Talking so, to you guys. so, so, um, you know, and we've kind of gone a little bit chronologically throughout, um, throughout, you know, the rogue one film. And I don't think you can have a conversation about rogue one without talking. Yeah. Of course the Vader, uh, hallway scene is, is the best scene in the movie. And that's the scene for the fans, but that's almost lives in the meta layer of Star Wars, right? The, like it's the best scene because it's the one that appeases the meta layer of Star Wars the most. But when you look at Rogue One as its own thing, you really are also looking at this epic war tragedy, right? And tragedy because um, perhaps through no fault of their own, so maybe tragedy is not the correct word, at the end of the film, everybody dies. Um, at least all the main characters die. Um, T tell me a little bit about that thought process. Was that part of Noel's original story that he knew that his lead character, his hero, was you know on a one-way journey, or was that something that also evolved through this iteration collaborative process? Don't remember what John's document did, but I don't think he certainly didn't kill everyone. And again, one of the earlier conversations that um, uh, Gareth and I had was. I don't remember who said it first, but it was very symbiotic. For a while, it was just me and him sitting around in an office in Burbank talking about just kicking around like big picture ideas for what the movie could be. And I remember one of us or both of us saying, like, I feel like this is a movie where they all need to die at the end. <laughs> right. Like this is this is a suicide mission, whether right. they know right. it or not. And the idea is, is that but like this, you know, if you're going to if you're going to lay your yeah. life on the line for any one cause for any one mission, it's this one. Yeah. Because if they don't steal those plans, 
the Star Wars trilogy is a very ser- very boring series of films about the Death Star going around blowing up planets until everyone surrenders. Right? Sure, sure. Like no one, who wants to see that? <laughs> and so like this is, I remember saying like, this is a movie about these heroes who give their lives so that so that the Star Wars universe can live. Like this is the this is the mission. This is the job that makes everything else in Star Wars, you know, beyond the the prequels possible. Mm. Right. This is what makes this is why the rebels win. Is this one mission? This is it, the most historically significant mission in the history of the the, the rebellion. Um and we wanted it to be a movie about kind of the beauty of that kind of sacrifice, like the ultimate sacrifice, you know, lay, lay, you know, giving up your own life so that others can live. And I remember we 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 watched a bunch of times uh, reference Gladiator again. Um mm-hmm. Russell Crowe's you know death scene at the end of Gladiator when he dies. And I remember running it for everyone in the room saying, like, you can have there can be such a thing as a beautiful death. Like it's sure. tragic, but it's also elegant and beautiful, and it's the right end for the character. And these characters have done their job, and it's and and now it's okay that they die because they can die knowing that they did it, they pulled it off. Um, and it can it doesn't have to be sad. It's gonna be sad, but it's gonna be okay. You're gonna it's gonna be bittersweet. Um and we love this idea, Gareth and I, but then we were like, wait, Disney had just bought Lucasfilm. Right. We didn't know what episode <laughs> seven was going to be. It's like, Disney's never going to let us do this. Like, they're not going to let us kill everyone, all the heroes at the end of a Star Wars film. In fact, they're right. going to like slap us up for even suggesting it. Like, is Disney familiar with what we do here at Disney? We don't kill all our heroes. Right, and, right, right. We and franchise and them. Of, the biggest miscalculation that I made was not trusting myself and not trusting the people above me to recognize that that was the right version of the movie. Because what I was afraid of were, and Gareth was as well, is if we write the, if we write this movie the, the way we want to write it and kill everyone at the end and we fall in love with it. And then Disney, as we suspect they probably will says, no, 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 you're not doing that. We'll be heartbroken. Right. Cause we know it's the right end of the film, but like, we didn't want to fall in love with it beyond just knowing it was the right way to go. And so to my, and this is one of the, like, one of the great screenwriting lessons I've learned from this is like, always trust yourself, write the version of the movie that you know is right. Not mm. the one that you think you can get away with. Um, Cause when I did write the first script, I always get K2, K2SO always died. Um, but Jin survived and she's alive at the end of my version of the movie. And I, I, I haven't gone back and looked at my script. A part of the reason is because I cringe when I think about the ending, because I know mm. I wrote the wrong ending for the film. Um, it should have been the ending that, I wanted to write, it should have been the ending that you eventually saw. And after I left and Chris Weitz came on, Chris told me this later because we became good friends. He said, I sat, I sat in a room and I read Gary's draft. And he's like, I, I feel like they all need to die at the end. That was my, that was his first interview. It was Gareth. And Gareth was like, Gary and I always said that. That's what we wanted to do. And, but we don't think they'll allow it. And Kathy was in the room at this point. She was like, I think that's a good idea. I think we should do that. And so it turned out that it was the right instinct and we would have gotten to do it. And, and, you know, thanks to Chris, you're being very smart and having the right instincts and Gareth going to bat for it and Kathy going to bat for it. We eventually got to the right ending of the movie, but I initially as a writer didn't have the courage to kill everyone. I knew it was the right thing to do, but I was terrified that I would write it and fall in love with it and Disney would make me rewrite it. But as it turned out, I should have had more faith in myself. I should have had more faith in, in Kathy and Disney and everyone else to recognize that this was the right ending for the film. Again, it's a standalone film. These characters don't need to go off and have other adventures. So we had the luxury of kind of killing them all off. And I thought the way they did it in the end was was really quite beautiful. Like again, K two S O always died, and so when he dies in the film, you kind of go, "Yeah, I get it." Like someone's got to die, right? Might as well be the droid. Yeah. But right. then they kill what I think Bodhi next. And you go, "Wait, hold on, him as well?" Like that's and I love the fact that it just like they like when they kill these characters. When Bodhi dies, they don't make a big deal out of it. He just dies. Yeah. Like the mm. shuttle just blows up, and we're instantly back into like the battle's still going. There's no room for no time for like emotion, like. The, no. we have not completed the mission yet yes he's dead but worry about that later we got to keep going the movie kind of has the energy and then you know cheer it and bays and you're kind of like wait hold on how many of these guys are going to die mm-hmm. but surely not like the main two but yeah the right. main two as well and you know it's that that there's there's a kind of a trilogy like a one two three punch at the end of the rogue one that i think works so well which is Jin and cassian dying on the beach which is obviously this beautiful moment um vader in the hallway which is just like holy shit just yeah. incredible and then the movie finally segueing into oh shit we're watching the beginning of a new hope now and right. that, and, th- and those three moments kind of coming back to back to back at the end of the movie i think that's why i think that's like a big reason why the movie is well i think the movie's good all the way through um but i think one of the reasons why when you ask people like what's your favorite movie of the disney star wars movie the disney era 
a lot of people say Rogue One. And I think the reason why is because that ending is, I, I remember saying at the time at the premiere, saying to someone, 90% of the way that people feel about a movie is decided in the last 10 minutes of the film. Like, how do you stick the landing? And the movie sticks sure. the landing so well, particularly in that Vader sequence. I remember being at Lucasfilm, coming to visit Gareth, and he was like doing some final touches on the film. And he had this hallway thing. But it wasn't, it was, it was, it was, there were no special effects. It was, it was Vader in the hallway, but you could still, you could see all the wires. There's no like laser beams. None of that's been added in yet. There's no music. When Vader like lifts it, force slams that guy into the ceiling, yeah. you can see all the wires pulling him up. He's just got a red stick. It's not a real lightsaber. So like it actually looks kind of lame, but you can see what it's going to be once they add layer. And I remember saying to Gareth, like, this is going to be, this is the movie that's going to have everyone in the movie off their seats. This scene at the end here is going right. to kill. And I can tell oh, that yeah. without seeing any visual effects. And I mean, it didn't take a genius to see that. You could see it and know, like anyone would look at it and go, oh my God, when this is done. And then of course, when we see it now, one of my favorite things to watch is like those reaction videos where people watch like yeah. trailers and scenes from films. And I must've watched a hundred people, even though it's not my scene, I take no credit for it. It's still incredibly, you know, cause it's part of the film that I worked on to watch people just freak the fuck out of that of, of that scene when he's just murdering people let every single force power force pull you yeah. know force push um you know force choke he does he, every single like trick in the uh, in the in the in the sith playbook he does across like the, like the 50 meters long hallway and it's just terrifying and you, you, you those guys banging on the door going let us out yeah. you know we're stuck in here with this maniac he's like there's no way we can defeat him <laughs> it's terrifying and it's so great and i'm so glad that ended up in the movie so yeah, it well, begs it begs the question, why didn't Vader use force pull on the dude with the Death Star plans? Just right there. You'd have to ask Vader. My <laughs> theory, I have no, my I had nothing to do. Like again, I had nothing to do with that scene, so you'd have to ask someone else. Well, he, he I, hated the Death Star. I will yeah, tell you. I will. I will. I mean, but that, I mean that may, that may or may not be true. It's not. That's not something we were tackling or thinking about during the making yeah. of the film. I don't think he hates it. I just. I just. I just don't think he has a lot of. I just think he has a lot of time for it. Like he just doesn't think it's that impressive. He, you yeah, know, he doesn't, doesn't, give, he don't doesn't be too proud of this it. technological terror you've constructed and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I just think that he he's thinking on a, I don't think he hates it. I, I just think he doesn't give a shit. I think he's yeah. thinking, he, he's thinking about other things. Um, I will tell you one thing. I, 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 not a lot of people know this, but it's an interesting piece of trivia. The guy, the rebel guy who in the, in the middle of all of that, who runs and pulls the lever that, 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 that releases the Tantive four. Oh, yeah. like, on its way that's yeah. gareth that's his cameo in the movie yeah yeah that's cool well look uh this is a great i think uh final accent on a wonderful interview um i that resonated very hard with me about the idea that you know when you write especially your first draft definitely write the one that you feel the best about and not try to placate to what you perceive somebody else's taste is going to be like i think that's an incredibly valuable lesson yeah that's the, that's like the one like if anyone here wants to take like one if anyone out here out there is interested in writing you know creatively that's the one lesson that i i was quite deep into my career when i learned that lesson you're always learning something new and i really really regret not making in the benefit of hindsight now i know it was the wrong choice at the time i didn't trust myself to write the version that i knew was riskier and had a chance of, of, of having my heart broken, but I knew it was the right ending. I didn't do it because I was, I was afraid of being, you know, disappointed, but ne never trust that voice. Always trust the voice that says, you know, this is the right one. Even though you might have to fight for it, even though you might get your heart broken, you know, this is the right call. Trust, you know, trust your feelings basically. <laughs> yeah. And, um, First of all, thank you very much for being here. Um, again, uh, your YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. No, his, just... his Twitch, his Twitter, and his YouTube are linked in the description yeah. below. I'm not on, like I'm not on Facebook because it's just yeah, me, yeah, but, me um, either. Uh, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube are the main three places you can find me. And in each case, my channel name is just Gary Witter, G-A-R-Y-W-H-I-T-T-A. And then we'll have you back someday whenever yeah, I'd love to. you got I'd love some to stuff to promote. Fun. And um, yeah, this was great. I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned thanks a lot. Thanks for having so. me. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you for all the donations to St. Jude's for this stream. And we will see you in the next Rule of Two. Catch you later. Peace.